Who are we becoming? To answer the question, it's good to look at who we were. I had a conversation yesterday with someone who was talking about the Chinese president was asked, what do you think about the French Revolution, the impact that it had on Western civilization? And he said, it's too early to tell. That long-term view of what's going on, where are we going? Something that fascinates me in Europe, especially. Who were the people who built this city of London? I just walked around the city of London today. I walked past Big Ben and Trafalgar Square, and the Queen's Memorial, and I was reflecting on who were these purple people? I've been kind of anti-monarchy, anti-establishment for a lot of my life, but reflecting, and I was listening to Andrew Tate and his brother talking about the Queen and the British Empire. And as you walk around this city, you think, who were these people who built this amazing infrastructure, this amazing city? And you, you know, say what you like about London now. The buildings, some of the buildings that have been built here are just absolutely phenomenally well built. It's hard to imagine. We couldn't build a city like this again now. Like, it seems completely not feasible. I've got the newspaper here that's talking about how the city of London can't afford to keep running the metro and how it's going to cost so much money. Think about building the London Underground. Like that infrastructure project that was carried out a long time ago. Who were these people who were able to organize this, who were able to afford this, who were able to build it in such a way that it lasts for a long, long time? I was walking up the steps and looking at the branding on the steps in the underground. And I'm thinking, who are these companies that are part of these massive infrastructure programs? I think the perspective and this wonder and awe that I have for this city at the moment is partly because I've spent most of the last year in the Balkans. And people say, you know, why would you live in Montenegro? And, you know, I tell them, well, it's beautiful. Like, you know, it's a great place to live. People, culture, uh, weather, landscapes. It's fantastic. It's cheap. And then you come to London and you look around and I get it more than I probably ever have of why people think, like, how could you live in Montenegro? How could you live in the Balkans? And I love, you know, where I am in, in the Balkans. I can see where people are coming from when they're like, it does, stuff just doesn't work. Like they didn't develop their countries. They didn't develop their people to the same degree as what's happened here in London. And it's not racism. It's infrastructure. It's physical. Like what has been built here is absolutely phenomenal. The density of it, it was built a long time ago and it was built by people who were very intelligent and who were building for the future. I don't see that same intelligence in the way we're developing things and we're building now. Maybe we can build really tall skyscrapers and, and give the illusion that we're more developed. But the people who built the city of London, they had a phenomenal vision and they execute on that vision in a way that I don't see replicated today. It's phenomenal what they did. It's just, I'm in awe. And I'm walking around and I'm listening to the accents and I'm looking at the different colors and cultures of the city. And I'm thinking, where, where are the people now who built this place? And how is it that people want to come from all around the world to be a part of this? And there's the two forces colliding. There's whoever built London and their force and their culture and the people who are arriving who want the opportunity of what London has to offer, higher wages, different opportunity, and, and the wonderment at the infrastructure and the place that's been built. That collision is, is a very interesting thing. Where does that go? What happens? It's a very slow collision that's been happening for centuries already. But where does that go? People from all over the British Empire when someone says they're Indian or they're Jamaican, when they came, a lot of those people, when they came to the city of London and they came to England, they came on a British Empire passport. They were effectively British citizens because that's how the legal side of it worked at that time, for better or worse. I'm not saying that colonialism and you know, didn't have its, its downsides, and but those people chose 
to come and experience what the heart of the British Empire was about. And they must have been absolutely blown away. I've been to a lot of different countries and, you know, gradually now places like Guatemala or places like Montenegro are being developed in terms of infrastructure and tourist resorts and different fancy buildings. But they're not building anything like the city that was built here with a long-term vision. It must have been absolutely mind-blowing for people to come from other parts of the world. And many of them did make a good life of it. Many of them chose to stay and people are still moving to this part of the world because of the favorable circumstances that can be found here and make more money. What also struck me today is how expensive it is to get around. Like, I don't care how much it costs for a train ticket and I actually took a short boat ride. There's a ferry service that sort of works like uh, the underground as well. It's called um, Uber Boats or something. And uh, I'd never done, I'd never been on one before, at least not that I remember. And so, you know, I bought a ticket for that as well. I had no idea how much it was going to cost, but I shuttled down the river a little bit. Uh, rather than catching a bus or a train to get a bit further. I caught a taxi from the airport to the city and it was like 60 pounds uh, for maybe 25, 30 minutes in the in a taxi. Uh, and then I spent probably another 20, 30 pounds on public transport, bus, boat, train, underground. And I also just got a hotel room and it's a tiny little shoebox of a thing. The bed almost touches both of the walls. I'm just going to be able to get my push-ups and, and squats in, in the, in the size of the room. And it was 170 pounds. And so I'm thinking like, how do people even afford to live here? But then with their wages, if they can manage to have a little bit on the side, then it goes a long way in other parts of the world. But yeah, it's, it's such a different world compared to where I've been in the Balkans for 170 pounds. I would be staying at a, one of the top hotels in Montenegro or in Serbia and it's very very you know we, we want to be in the beautiful place and that culture of achievement had to be so strong in the culture that built this place the willingness to work the lust for achievement and creativity in the buildings the beautiful buildings and structures that were created I'm curious, you know, who were these people? Maybe it's, you know, just some evil ruling class. Well, why, why do they make things so beautiful? You know, why is it that it doesn't feel like it was built in that way, in that culture? And people say it about the pyramids as well. It doesn't feel like it was built by people under duress, people who, who weren't in love with what they were doing. But I don't necessarily take history on face value either i'm not sure what you think about that you know what is the history that we've been told versus what actually happened it makes me very curious i'm fascinated by this city and it was amazing to have this sort of a day of thinking about who did it who did this who built this and therefore who are we becoming and what are we going to build because it takes generations to be able to build the momentum to execute on something like this. Like we're building this little village in Montenegro, we're building this little village in Vanuatu, building, and we're gonna keep building and we're gonna make them beautiful. But how, how do you execute on these massive infrastructure programs? Like it takes the coordination of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people moving in the same direction staying in harmony enough for a long period of time to accumulate the knowledge and to execute. And that's something to behold. It's something that should not be disregarded lightly. And this is a very different person who's speaking right now compared to the angry 20 something year old, 22 year old who used to live here in London. And I'd go out with my brother and I was reading Che Guevara and I was learning Spanish. And I was angry at how there was so much wealth here and yet quality of life 
didn't seem to be as good as it could be and other parts of the world were without resources and without opportunity. I see this city through different eyes 18 years later, nearly 18 years. But yeah, what an opportunity. I don't believe you can become anything like your best self without significant amounts of travel. And even though I've been to somewhere close to 50 countries now, I'm still blown away going to London, a place that I've been many times. It was also wonderful to experience London in freedom. We came here on the way through to Sark and the airport was not a nice place to be. And the whole tone of the place, the energy of the place was really, really heavy uh, in 2020. Today, I scanned my passport, walked through, didn't have to talk to anyone. Uh, there's probably two, 3% of people are wearing masks uh, walking around the city and the energy is completely different and I love it. I still have hope. I love seeing human potential explored. I love seeing people who want to build and want to achieve. This is a city that is a massive symbol of what humanity is capable of. And that spirit is still definitely alive here today. The people who've come from all around the world to experience the best of what they can create and potentially some of the best of what humanity has ever been capable of and ever created. Love to hear your thoughts.